the bird just back and behind them, that slightly grey chap, uh, is a Cape turtle dove. A very, very common sight throughout this wooded savannah. And the little terrapin crossing past again. And now these birds have got to be a little bit careful around the terrapins. Uh, terrapins, after all, are uh, omnivorous, but um, they are pretty fantastic hunters. And usually specializing on things um, in the water, but they will happily catch a wading bird by the foot and drown it. Alrighty, well, I think uh, let's keep things flowing today. Um, let's head over to Namedi in a similar sort of neck of the woods to see what's happening there. Haha, <laughs> brilliant. So uh, we're currently in Olifant's West Game Reserve. Uh, just outside the little Limpopo town of Hoodsbreit, uh, on the western boundary of the Greater Kruger National Park, at uh, Naledi with a beautiful elephant bull by the looks of things. Uh, not a massive guy, he's not completely fully grown, but I guess it's all relative, he's probably still a five ton animal. 11,000 pounds, something like that. Uh, Ellie's, as many of you will know, um, are notoriously fussy drinkers. So rather than sipping from that slightly tepid stuff uh, off on the left there, uh, this Ellie is making the educated choice to drink the right from the well onto outlet. Joanne Mello, thanks very much for your message and uh, happy Thursday to you as well. Thanks for. Uh, Checking in with us here at live at the waterhole. What a great way to spend a Thursday afternoon. This elephant is certainly putting away quite a bit of water there. And he will easily go through between 150 and 200 liters of water a day. That's just one elephant. The Kruger is probably home to between 15 and 20,000 eggs. A grey goer bird. Um, also perched on that little stump just behind the waterhole there. Uh, interesting little characters from this, uh, this Serena woodland. turning to give us a little bit of a better look there. Uh, King has just asked a question and he or she has said, is that line down its back the vertebrae? And now King, absolutely it is. And you can see the curvature of that spine. Um, it's quite interesting to note, while it looks like a curve from the outside, and um, if you Google the structure of an elephant skeleton, that, um, that shape is actually created by, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know the technical term for them, but sort of the, the sharpest points of the vertebra, which kind of project upwards. Uh, do yourself a favor, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google what an elephant skeleton actually looks like. Um, and then have a think about um, what it must be like for that elephant to have, uh, or some elephants in certain circumstances, uh, to have a saddle strapped onto their back and uh, maybe two or three tourists and a, a mahout or a handler um, on top of their shoulder. And um, it's reckoned to cause incredible, incredible pain and long-term. 
possibly even like, causing things like arthritis and other horrible problems. And thankfully, across much of Africa's safari industry, uh, elephant riding or elephant back safari is to be a thing of the past. We're moving into sort of a, a new period of, of more conscious, uh, sustainable ecotourism. Something ride a horse. But yeah, thanks for the question, King. An interesting thought. And now this chap has broken off that left tusk there. You can see the one on the right is significantly longer. Now that left one won't regrow, but uh, tusks do continue to grow throughout an elephant's life. Actually, probably growing the most in the final 10 years. So probably his, uh, his 40s or 50s is where you'll see the most growth. Uh, but that left one will always be a bit shorter. Now, provided he hasn't damaged the enormous nerve's core, but uh, won't affect him too too much at all. But should that um, should that nerve be damaged in some way, it can cause huge problems for um, for these animals. And tusks are broken for various reasons, but probably most realistically would have been a confrontation with another bull. Uh, fights can be pretty serious. I've certainly seen chips of ivory knocked right off. And occasionally, on, on sort of slightly rarer occasions, uh, bulls can even inflict fatal wounds on one another. So the fighting really can be pretty ferocious. And again, that's all in pursuit of the right to mate with females. Elephants are not territorial, not in the same way that something like a lion or uh, perhaps a leopard would be. But um, kind of a dominant bull in an area will fight for the rights to mate with all of the females within range. Turning in for his close-up. That's very nice. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you can see that tusk uh, snapped off pretty, uh, pretty catastrophically there. Doesn't seem to be bothering him too much, though. And he's off on his missions. And he's not alone. A number of bulls here. So once again, this is a bachelor group, um, a collection of, of males that kind of gravitate towards one another for their, uh, their social needs for company. Now the bulls have a very well-defined social structure, and uh, which all centers around kind of the transference uh, or the sharing of knowledge. Uh, generally, there will be one, at least one very large, experienced male um, in this association, and he will um, kind of mentor the younger guys. Keeps them out of trouble, keeps them from getting too carried away fighting, teaches them how to uh, kind of approach female elephants. It really is uh, an incredible social network.
Uh, Joan Mello, thanks very much for your question as well. You've asked, uh, are the tusks hollow or solid all the way through? So, Joanne, for the first two-thirds, moving kind of downwards from the tip, the tusk is uh, solid. But uh, there is a cavity right in the base where that nerve sort of does extend forward. So, uh, provided it's not broken all the way back, kind of up into the elephant's uh, top jaw, uh, that won't cause too many problems. But should that nerve be exposed, I'm sure it would be extremely, extremely painful. If you've ever encountered uh, problems with your teeth, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's a really, really a sharp, a pretty a mind-blowing pain. And then, of course, there is uh, definitely the, the potential for infection to get in there, and that could uh, quite possibly be fatal. Thanks, Joanne. These bulls just kind of drifting off into this landscape now. Time to head off in search of uh, something tasty to eat. I've seen reports of that uh, magnificent elephant tusker we've seen around Pridelands with uh, wild earth and in this area at the moment. So there is always the chance that he could pop out. It would be wonderful to see him again. And this was in fact the first place I ever met um, old Izzawini, something like uh, 10 or 11 years ago now in one of the very earliest chapters of my guiding career. Nice to start things off with um, some elephant activity though. We didn't see too many Ellies at all on uh, yesterday's, uh, yesterday's show. So hopefully that's a nice indication of things to come. Hopefully it's a, a busy afternoon out there. I am uh, definitely looking forward to checking a couple of our different locations and seeing what's new. You can hear the calls of the European bee eaters um, in the air above us there somewhere. They sound a little bit, um, a little bit like, with some imagination, um, the whistle of a, a referee. Now those birds have made an epic migration down to Africa for uh, the summer. They've come from as far as southern Spain um, to capitalize on a boom of insects. Uh, which occurs um, in equatorial and sort of sub-equatorial Africa with the rains. They fatten up on those bugs, and get nice and strong, and then turn around just as the season begins to move into drier conditions for us, and they head all the way back up to, uh, to where they started.
All righty. Uh, I think time now to check uh, somewhere completely different. Let's head up to Tau in uh, South Africa's northwest. On the opposite side of the country now in uh, South Africa's Medikwe Game Reserve, right up in the northwest. And we are checking things out at an equally cloudy and overcast location. It's looking very, very dry and heat here in the Again, we seem to be into a bit of an El Nino La Nina year. And here in uh, Southern Africa, it is quite dry, a lot drier than we would like. For um, this time of year, for March, so late in the rainy season. But um, yeah, maybe those those clouds above hold a little bit of relief for us. Still, quite a bit of uh, life on crocs here. There are. Is that one? I think it is. Looks a bit like a log, but I think it's a crocodile with its tail facing us on the mud in the top right corner there. There's a bit of a delay on this uh, Tau camera, so it uh, doesn't react instantly to our kind of control inputs. But uh, certainly, that is one of our crocodilians stretched out on the mud. Bit of a funny perspective of him from behind. You can see that incredible skin though, um, what appears like uh, scales along the back, uh, scales or scutes, is actually something we refer to as an osteoderm. So osteo bone, uh, derm skin. It's kind of a hybrid of both. So when crocodiles are born, the skin is quite cartilaginous. Um, consists of something similar to a kind of what's in your nose and uh, what's in your ears but gradually as that crocodile matures um, that, um, that substance actually ossifies, it turns to bone so it's quite literally armor plating and that will help to protect that crocodile from uh, the hooves of uh, sort of a thrashing antelope or a zebra if it does latch onto something as big as that and perhaps even the jaws of other crocodiles when they fight one another. And they do from time to time. Amazing how those um, back feet actually uh, look something like flippers, like whale flippers. And they do absolutely have toes and webs which are sort of uh, not quite uh, visible at the moment, but certainly for that back kind of trailing edge, um, very, very streamlined for movement through the water. And that gives the crop the ability to move through the shallows without really even disturbing the mud or the water. That's something pretty critical when it is stalking uh, some prey. And quite frighteningly, they also have the ability to sit beneath the surface of the water without breathing for as much as uh, 90 minutes, an hour and a half. They slow down their uh, rate of oxygen consumption, they slow down the heart rate, basically to kind of a state of suspended animation, just waiting for something to come within range. And then they can explode almost their entire body length out of the water onto land now with a bite force strong enough to crush bone certainly got a lot of respect for a crocodile they can be very dangerous and they certainly um, are responsible for a lot of uh, loss of human life in Africa each year Uh, 
Robert4127 has asked if I've ever seen an animal that has been struck by lightning. Absolutely, Robert. So uh, maybe two years ago, visiting uh, the Kruger National Park, um, kind of the morning after a massive cyclone had come through, uh, we actually had a sighting of um, an elephant bull that was taking refuge under a tree. And um, unfortunately, this enormous marula tree took a direct hit from a bolt of lightning. And, um, and yeah, um, obviously some of that energy, uh, we're talking millions of volts, um, traveled from the tree into that elephant and killed it instantly. So it certainly does happen. I've heard of it happening with um, herds of wildebeest out in open plains and even giraffes, uh, which you can understand being so tall. Nice yawn from that crop. Uh, Liz UK has asked, has a croc ever gone for an elephant? And Liz, they most certainly do. And there's quite a bit of footage of the uh, vetties and elephants coming down to drink and crocodiles grabbing them by the end of the trunk. Now, even for the very largest of crocs, the, um, uh, the kind of strength that would actually take to pull an elephant forwards into the water is uh, usually just something the crop is not able to do. Uh, in contrast, uh, the elephant can very often pull the entire crocodile out of the water and, and uh, teach it on that. But yeah, the trunk is, uh, is arguably an extremely sensitive organ, so um, I have no doubt that the slamming jaw pressure of a crocodile could do some pretty serious damage. Not something yet, something the Ellie wants to have to deal with at all. Now this crocodile is not particularly interested in doing any hunting today. Uh, most of their um, activities to search for food will be conducted in the water. And this guy is just basking in the sun today. Now, while it is um, completely overcast uh, here in Medikwe today, there will still be um, a degree of ultraviolet rays sort of penetrating through that cloud. So this crop may just have to sit on the bank a little bit longer to charge himself up. He looks pretty well charged already, actually. If they sort of uh, internal batteries so to speak are very very low the skin is extremely dark and then as the crocodile heats up it becomes uh, much lighter almost a yellow sort of greenish uh, light shade it might not look like the nicest place for this guy to live but um, I'm sure this water is full of fish, there'll be lots of catfish here. After all, 70% of a crocodile's diet is fish. I think this skinny-legged uh, guy that we're looking at is a black-winged stilt, a slightly immature one. A fully mature um, individual has pitch black wings and then a snow-white kind of belly, chest and head. Just scanning around in the shallows here with his very skinny legs, hoping to disturb something to feed on, a little crustacean, a mollusk, perhaps a tiny frog or a little tiny fish. Alrighty, speaking of Tao, I think uh, we're actually going to have a look at a clip of something quite interesting that was filmed here. Wow, beautiful. That is a seriously magnificent looking lioness just on the opposite side of the dam there. Got a bit of a club foot by the look of things. 
without doubt, an injury system. It's a brutal business having to find your own food and certainly tackling big, heavy bodies, um, antelope, zebra, things like buffalo. It can be a hazardous business for pride flights. They very regularly break uh, break bones. Seems to be pretty well healed though. She's certainly lost a bit of muscle tone on that front left leg. She's moving quite nicely. And she's got a lovely full belly, so she's eating soon or easy. And uh, predators with full bellies seem to need to drink water. I'm sure that's why she was there. Uh, but anyway, that was great. Nice to see. A little bit more uh, water bird activity here. Another knobbed coot. Three banded plovers just up on the uh, left there. In amongst all of this, a kind of uh, decaying floating vegetation that we're looking at. Uh, there must be plenty of little decomposers, little insects and other life forms uh, breaking this stuff down. And the birds are, are cashing in on all that's available there. You can see kind of these channels that the elephants have, have uh, created through the mud there as they've waded in to try and access this nice green grass. That's actually pretty beneficial. It'll give um, uh, things like the fish, things like terrapins, a much easier ability to move through um, as this uh, as this pan becomes quite low. And it is very low. I think this is the lowest I've seen it. Could certainly do with a, a top off. Oh, there's another croc. Very, very well fed looking crocodilian. He is not struggling at all. You can see the deposits of fat kind of along the tail there. Very, very plump looking. Now a crocodile in this uh, kind of level of, of condition uh, probably put itself into a state of dormancy and, uh, and not need to eat for perhaps a year and uh, at a push maybe even two years. In really, really terrible years though a tiny dam wall or a, a river bank are going maybe five or six meters 30 odd foot something like that or rather 15 20 foot and uh, yeah they'll situate themselves in a nice spot and uh, basically enter a state of uh, of torpor or suspended animation probably one of the reasons that the crocodile has been on this through good times and bad for the last 500 million years. One of the oldest species out there, unchanged from the time of the dinosaurs. Talk about uh, a winning set of characteristics. But yeah, these crocs are certainly on a bit of a go slow today. Again, with uh, not too much sun exposure. Um, them being ectotherms, in layman's terms, cold-blooded. They um, are in need of a bit of a charge up. A wonderful look at those osteoderms I was talking about um, a little bit earlier, those uh, scaly scutes that have actually kind of transitioned into, into bone.
Martin has asked, can crocodiles hold food in their bellies for an extended period like snakes? Uh, thanks for your question, Martin. Um, no, not, uh, not to my knowledge. And um, certainly uh, from kind of a childhood spent um, keeping uh, a bit of a collection of, of reptiles and snakes and things like that, it's actually not good for reptiles to sit for long periods of time with undigested food in their bellies. It can happen um, certainly in captivity if, um, if incorrect heating is, uh, is provided. If a reptile is too cold, it uh, very often struggles to kind of regulate its internal processes. So certainly something like a snake uh, that's fed some sort of little mammal or a bird or something that isn't provided with heat uh, can actually kill it. With that food kind of festering and starting to rot in its belly. So no, I would think uh, crocodiles not very long at all. Having said that though, um, one nice meal can set them up for a, a couple of weeks. But uh, I think it's more a case of them turning that meal into energy and having the ability to store it uh, rather than uh, actually keeping that food in their belly for a long time. Possibly something of a, of a myth. But yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for the question, Martin. Interesting food for thought. Uh, Leo has asked, is their skin much thinner than that of elephants and rhinos? Uh, Leo, I would think so. So um, we talk about the skin of an elephant probably being about an inch thick in most places. So I think an inch is about 2.2 centimeters thick. A rhino possibly 4 to 5 centimeters thick in some places. Now, obviously that's not all the skin. Um, the skin around their eyes, between their legs. Uh, behind their ears in both elephant and rhino can be uh, velvety soft and certainly very thin. Uh, croc skin, I would think, even on a really big individual, is probably uh, not more than about a centimetre thick. And that probably comes, um, I would guess, from their need to use their skin uh, to thermoregulate. It's perhaps a little bit more thermal and thermal efficiency to have it a bit thinner. Quite an interesting array of birds here. We've got a yellow-billed stork center stage there, a grey heron with his head tucked away off on the right, an Egyptian goose in the back. Everybody just taking it easy today, doing some preening, cleaning and oiling those feathers. And uh, taking the opportunity for a bit of a rest, by the looks of it. A couple of Egyptian geese around. That looks like quite a big gosling, uh, almost certainly raised by um, a set of adults in this area this season. A lucky survivor with the three or four crocodiles that uh, call this place home. Again, many of these birds specialize in capturing fish, uh, which are becoming stranded in uh, ever-shrinking pools uh, here at Tau. So it makes sense for these birds to, to just hang around here all the time, really. And the two on the left there might look a little bit like that yellow-billed stalk, but they're actually African spoonbills. They're tucking their heads away, having a rest. And certainly also here to capitalize on the fish. And I didn't even notice it, but uh, just beneath the spoonbills is another crocodile. Crocodile number three. A testament to how well these things camouflage. Let's see if you can spot him before we zoom in. 
he literally just looks like um, like mud. And if they're that tricky to spot for us as, as humans, with very well-developed brains, good eyes that see in color, and um, a strong sense of imagination that gives us the ability to piece together something from uh, a single element or a single shape. There we go. Now our crock is a little bit more on the right, it's directly underneath. But you see how tricky it is. Um, whoever's directing there is thinking that uh, muddy thing at the back there is a crock. The crock is a little further on the right. Again, we have a slight delay on this um, on this camera. It's being driven from Johannesburg, but the tower is many, many, many hundreds of uh, kilometers away. The bird that we're looking at there was a great white egret, also a fish eater. Now you can see quite a bit of movement, lots of water birds in there, eating a bit of greenery, looking for crustaceans, little life forms in the water. Uh, this is rapidly becoming quite a treacherous place for, um, for the local wildlife though. They had a movement in the water, I wonder if that was a crocodile or a, or a fish. Uh, but yeah, in the uh, treacherous in the sense that um, uh, this mud is getting pretty thick and the water available is kind of shrinking and shrinking. A couple of zebra, a lone wildebeest there. Lots of zebra. Very, very nice. Yeah, quite easy in uh, kind of the, the worst part of the dry season for animals to be trapped in the mud as they come down to, uh, to take a drink. Yeah, they're pushed a little bit further every day into kind of the danger zone by those rapidly shrinking pools of water. But obviously the drive to, to get enough water to survive is, uh, is pretty strong. Yeah, I reckon it is catfish blowing those uh, bubbles and creating that disturbance in the water. There's not a whole else, a whole lot else that can survive in these um, fairly stagnant, uh, quite muddy, unoxygenated pools. Uh, catfish have the ability, when oxygen levels in water are very, very low, to actually gulp air with their mouths. Uh, whereas most other fish have to breathe with their gills, and a catfish kind of has the ability, to a limited degree, to do both. And if things are really, really bad, they will even uh, kind of come walking up out of the mud and, um, and travel pretty remarkable distances, kind of walking on their fins uh, over land to another source of water. Bizarre, pretty uh, um, ancient looking things. As Shivers asked, can those bony scales on crocodiles regrow if the croc is injured? As Shiv, um, I, don't, I don't think they can 100% regenerate, like uh, the tail of a lizard or something like that. But um, 
certainly the healing capabilities of uh, of crocodiles and alligators in particular are second to none. Even in the filthiest of conditions, this horrendously dirty, stagnant water, a croc or something as horrendous as uh, with a severed tail or a missing leg uh, suffers no infection at all. As a result, scientists in uh, Europe and the United States have actually done pretty extensive testing on uh, the blood of crocodiles and alligators uh, because of its, um, its ability to stop the spread of bacteria and disease. Who knows, maybe there's some sort of uh, medicinal significance in there, something we can uh, kind of channel and synthesize into something life-saving for humans. I think there are a lot of answers to um, human medical problems in the natural world. Science has only really just scraped the surface in the last hundred odd years. It will be interesting to, um, to see what happens uh, kind of in the rest of our lifetimes. Thanks for the question, Shiv. In spite of pretty dry conditions in the back there, these zebra look in very good physical condition. Their bellies can be a bit misleading because the stomach is essentially just an enormous balloon full of gas. But generally looking at uh, like the tone of the muscle on the legs and uh, down the spine, along the neck, these guys are nice and healthy. It's been a good season, even if it has been a, a bit of a dry one. Hear the calls of those red billed buffalo weavers in the background, one of the small five, and uh, that kind of squawking call and the tell spurfowl, our answer to uh, a little partridge or a pheasant type thing that you might see in the northern hemisphere. Yeah, even though it is dry, this tile landscape really is quite spectacular. With those uh, rocky, hilly formations around this quite dry, open plain. Certainly a very photogenic landscape. Alrighty, I think we're going to head over to Old Donyo in northern Kenya now and see what's happening up there. Alrighty, a very, very different scene coming to you live from uh, Old Donyo um, in southern Kenya. Uh, where the rains have most certainly arrived and by the looks of a lot of that uh, cumulus formation in the sky above us uh, there could be more on the way as well good news i believe uh, kenya has had a couple of very dry years so uh, a bit of relief is well deserved
beautiful. We've got some sort of species of wider. Uh, it looks like a pintailed wider, uh, which we'd find uh, in southern Africa. I'm not 100% sure of the species here. If anybody coming to us from East Africa knows, uh, feel free to let me know. But yeah, I'd be willing to bet it's, um, it's a wider, possibly some kind of pintailed variant. And again, uh, quite a prominent sexual dimorphism exists um, across a number of bird species, but especially with these widers, in the sense that the male is quite spectacular looking. And he grows that uh, quite striking plumage, a very unusual long tail. And then the females are the slightly drabber individuals uh, off on the left. I've had a, a brief look on uh, on Google, uh, but uh, unsuccessfully. I'm not 100% sure of the species of that uh, of that wider exactly, but yeah, beautiful nonetheless. And again, the uh, water being provided um, artificially here at the waterhole at Old Donio uh, will draw in. A multitude of exciting things. We've seen all sorts of interesting sightings from some of the largest super tusker elephants in the world to um, tiny birds, agama lizards. Nice to take a look at, at some of the little things as well. It's not always all about the big stuff. That thing in the tree did look a bit like a bird, but it uh, was just one of the branches. We did have a couple of elephant bulls and a few giraffes here around the water hole just before we went live but I have a feeling they have uh, moved off there's obviously quite a bit of greenery around for them to be browsing on browsing and grazing and I'm sure there is uh, quite a bit of water available out in the bush looks like our widers have returned though and again, that spectacular tail plays uh, a pretty vital role, that guy not sticking around, um, in mate selection. So the theory being that uh, the male with the strongest genetics, and um, there he is, the highest um, kind of expression of testosterone in his system, will develop the most perfect feathers. So it's a very easy visual way for him to... Um, Kind of advertises presence to the to the females. Yeah, a very visual indication of virility. A female can be sure that if she selects him as a mate, her chicks will carry those uh, very strong genes as well. And thus, um, we have once again. The uh, theory of natural selection and survival of the fittest. Darwin's work in a nutshell.
as Stain has asked a question, uh, do some birds disperse seeds more than others? I'm um, uncertainly Stain. So uh, things like the, um, let me think of a good example. Things like the seed cracking birds, things like uh, waxbills are far more likely to kind of destroy a seed as they process it. Essentially, they want uh, the very palatable and uh, full inner, inner part of that seed. So splitting it open, they kind of uh, render that seed uh, very digestible. But ultimately, even if it, um, if it passes through their gut, um, it's not going to germinate. It's not going to grow. And then you look at something like an African green pigeon, which seems to have a much weaker digestive system. They... Um, they digest soft fruit very, very well, but an enormous amount of seed um, ends up arriving in their droppings. And certain plant species, like uh, the large-leafed rock fig that we see across many of these sort of low-felt areas, low-felt reserves, uh, relies on those um, African green pigeons to actually disperse the seed. Yeah, that large leaf rock fig in particular, quite amazingly, and the seeds have to be exposed to a minimum of 60 degrees Celsius in order to germinate. So if, um, if the dropping lands on the ground or um, yeah, someplace that um, isn't good at conducting heat and they uh, won't rise up to about 60, perhaps even higher, the seed will never grow. But if it lands on top of a boulder or perhaps a leadwood tree, uh, which will get hot enough, the seeds germinate. And as a result, that's why we always see those fig trees in uh, leadwoods or on outcrops. Pretty amazing. Thanks, Stan. Lots and lots of life around the water's edge. Thousands of tiny butterflies there. Pretty difficult to get an ID on them. They're probably only an inch wide, something like that. But quite possibly one of the common grass species. And so very often the insect concentrations in an environment are such a phenomenal indicator of the health of that ecosystem at the present time. Index, uh, insects, rather, of course, forming kind of the, the foundational level of uh, the food pyramid. So responsible for, uh, for pollination and um, feeding of so many species. on your so lush and so healthy at the moment. Alrighty, I believe we've got some activity around uh, Naledi, so let's head back to Olifants West in South Africa's Limpopo region. A 
<laughs> a nice breeding herd of Ellie's back at uh, Naledi Dam, very close to Naledi Camp, here in uh, Olifant's West, outside Woodspray. So a very big cow off on the right and a whole collection of uh, little youngsters. Once again, all choosing to do uh, the majority of their drinking from the well itself. That is, after all, the cleanest water available. And then they may um, head into that pond on the left occasionally to have a bit of a splash, as I think that one disappearing into the bush did. Not too keen to hang around. Quick drink and off they go. Uh, these Ellies kind of have their work cut out for them as this environment dries up. And uh, comparing it to Old Donio, you can see uh, just how dry it actually is. And these Ellies have obviously got to work harder to meet all of their needs. And uh, quite a bit of food it is for an adult bull, as much as a quarter ton, over 500 pounds of food every day. And talking of seed dispersal, we were chatting about it uh, with regards to birds at Aldonio. But uh, elephants are some of the most phenomenal seed dispersers on the planet. Obviously, in some areas, having the ability to walk 25 kilometers through the bush every day. If they are lucky enough to find a fruiting tree, which very often they do, with their phenomenal sense of smell, they could um, quite realistically carry those seeds for miles. And, of course, um, deposit them in a lovely pile of uh, very nutrient and nitrogen-rich fertilizer, which is elephant dung. One of the great custodians of this uh, environment, for sure, is the elephant. But everything in balance, if elephants in uh, vast numbers are kind of restricted into an area, something that happens more and more as their ranges are kind of constricted by uh, human development. And we are seeing negative effects on, uh, on the vegetation. They do, of course, push over trees and uproot shrubs and things like that. So, uh, yeah, everything in balance. Elephants have to have the ability to move once they've depleted an area's uh, resources. It's one of the things that makes this Olifants West Game Reserve such a lovely concept. It is private land, but um, it is open to the... Oh, there's another elephant. It is open to the Kruger National Park on its eastern side. So there's an enormous through flow of, uh, of animals, very natural circulation. Probably more members of the same herd here, more youngsters. Very, very thirsty. Thankfully, there's quite a bit of uh, artificial water around here on the Olifants West Game Reserve. Many of the lodges have little camp pans. And there are probably good, a, a good 10 or 12, possibly more lodges in this area. So the elephant herds just kind of drift between the lodges and the river, uh, browsing through these red bush willow thickets through the day.
I was actually chatting to somebody who works at Old Donio on uh, Instagram only this morning. So I'm going to see if um, she has got any idea what that mystery, uh, very pale looking wider was. And hopefully if she gets back to me in, um, in the show, I can uh, let you know. count ourselves extremely fortunate throughout much of the greater Kruger and certainly many of these uh, private reserves, the Sabi Sand, um, the Timbavati, Olifants West, touch wood. Uh, we don't seem to have any issues with people coming in um, to try and poach these magnificent elephants. But, um, but yeah, that is not the same story uh, throughout all of Africa. There are many, many, many more places. Elephants are in very good trouble. Uh, yeah, as many as a hundred elephants a day lose their lives in uh, in Africa, um, all in pursuit of those fairly silly tusks, which are essentially just teeth. Uh, without a doubt, it carves beautifully. Um, skilled carvers in places like China and Vietnam can turn it into all sorts of magnificent things. But um, yeah, if you imagine it being hacked out of the skull of an elephant, which might still be alive, often uh, in front of young calves, causing huge and fairly irreversible trauma, that's a much less attractive commodity to own, I would think. It's also reckoned that there is some sort of um, breakdown in understanding uh, by the people who are actually consuming or rather uh, purchasing ivory products as to how exactly those tusks are harvested. Uh, the Chinese quite famously um, consume millions of tons of, of tons of deer antlers every year for their uh, supposed medicinal properties, and none of which exist. But um, I believe the understanding is that uh, much like deer shed their antlers once a year, uh, many of these people are told that uh, elephants shed their tusks as well, which is of course absolute nonsense. And they do have a set of milk tusks, a little bit like we get milk teeth as, uh, as human babies, and those are shed, but uh, they're absolutely tiny, tiny things. They only get one big set of tusks, and uh, those tusks cannot be dropped. And the elephant has to die for them to be removed in their entirety from the skull. So yeah, I guess um, the point behind that ramble is uh, wherever you travel in the world, if, uh, if ever you come across ivory, uh, even if somebody tells you it's, it's antique, you can do your bit to protect elephants in Africa by simply never, ever purchasing any of it, regardless of how, how pretty it is or what the salesman tries to tell you. It certainly costs an elephant its life, and if the buying stops, uh, the killing can too.
Yeah, it looks like those Ellie's are just kind of disappearing over the hill there. Kind of uh, heading off for a bit of a feed, as I said earlier. It's a pretty rugged landscape here on Baluli, quite rocky, very hilly, but there is, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of water around and plenty of food. So it's a recipe for elephant sightings, and early sightings are, uh, are common throughout the year here. Quite amazing chatting to somebody who uh, runs a field guiding school here uh, on Olifants West. Uh, very, very recently she told me that um, a brown hyena was actually spotted here on Olifants West by someone on a game drive. And that'll be the first reported sighting certainly in like the last 10 years. Really wonderful to know that um, they do exist in this environment. I've certainly seen them around, not specifically here in Olifants West, but in uh, Makalali, a reserve uh, maybe 40 or 50 kilometers away, perhaps not as much as that. And they are found, and I have seen them. But of course, the best place to go and see something like that would probably be uh, the Kalahari, parts of South Africa's north, northern Cape. I've certainly had some wonderful brown hyena sightings on Tswalu with guests. Bird calls that you're hearing there belong to blue waxbills. A very common, oh, and a little terrapin there in the mud. Maybe two. A low felt meat pie, if you will. <laughs> yeah, again, these conditions might look pretty disgusting. That uh, water is certainly tepid, very stagnant. You can see. Lots of bubbles sort of trapped in that slime. It's pretty gaseous. Lots of decay going on in there. But for something like a terrapin, there is enough food around. And they're pretty hardy and uh, resilient enough to actually uh, make that a little paradise.
quite a few dragonflies kind of swooping in for a, a gulp of water there as well. They are heavily carnivorous, the dragonflies. They'll be um, catching other flying insects as they go. And they are, uh, after all, some of the finest flyers out there. Capable, much like a helicopter, of hovering, uh, flying backwards, flying left, flying right. Amazing things. Uh, also, one of the oldest organisms on the planet. Uh, fossils of uh, early dragonflies date back billions of years, uh, predating even the dinosaurs, even crocodiles. Difficult to get a good close look at. They are obviously super quick. We really have had a good look at a, a bit of a variety today from some pretty impressive big stuff to the very, very tiniest. And of course, as ever, there is beauty in every living thing. If you're willing to give it your time and give it your attention, um, there is magic all over the place. Alrighty, speaking of magic, I think let's head back over to Old Donio. There appears to be some sort of a delay there. <laughs> At least we have some, some lovely bird calls in the interim. So back over at uh, Old Donio, we're again looking at <laughs> some sort of bird species that I don't know. Um, this is without a doubt one of the starlings. I'm going to see if I can find it. So this is a superb starling. Uh, and we'll venture onto Google has answered that one for me. I've only spent uh, the bare minimum of time in East Africa. I did a, a trip up to uh, see the mountain gorillas in um, in uh, Rwanda and uh, spent a couple of days in Akagera National Park as well which is a bit more of a savanna type landscape with fellow wild earth naturalist Kelly Oldacre uh, a number of years ago so yeah I haven't had much of an opportunity to um, to learn the birds but there are certainly similarities between uh, a lot of the species that occur up here and um, and the species that we see down in the south. I'm speaking in broader terms though. I can identify that that is a wider <laughs> but not perhaps its exact species. I did send a message to my friend at Aldonio to uh, hopefully get a bit of a clarification there. But we shall see. Interestingly, um, a lot of these widers are brood parasites. So a bit like the, um, the cuckoo is famed for uh, laying its eggs in another bird's nest and uh, kind of tricking, uh, tricking that other bird species into um, doing all of the work raising those chicks or a single chick often at the detriment to its own family is very very characteristic of these guys all 
Alrighty, we have an answer. That is a straw-tailed wider, which is um, aptly named. It does look like that tail is made of a, a few strands of pretty yellow straw. Cool. Every day is a school day. Just having a bit of a scan around there to see if uh, anything has, has come down. A couple of those starlings around the water's edge. And they are magnificent. Sure, I like that uh, very pale eye. It's extremely striking. On the background of that uh, sort of viridescence of feathers. There's also a very large yellow butterfly that keeps flying across the screen there. I think that is an autumn leaf vagrant. Maybe we'll get lucky and he'll uh, sit still on uh, one of these rocks or something. We'll keep an eye out for him. Yeah, again, we try and look at these safaris as holistically as possible. I think it would be uh, a terrible, terrible shame and also pretty shallow to just look at uh, the big impressive stuff. I've always found um, enormous satisfaction in identifying and appreciating the littler things. Birds, bugs, reptiles, frogs. Yeah, that butterfly is flapping around on the opposite, opposite side there, but not sitting still really. Almost certainly coming down to this uh, kind of moist, muddy surface to suck minerals off of that clay. These butterflies live a fairly short life, usually not more than a season. So it's a bit of a, a, bit of a race against time. And they essentially have to um, develop as a caterpillar on the right plant species. They develop rapidly, avoid predators and then uh, transform by a chrysalis into a butterfly very very rapidly collect enough food to maintain energy levels and then uh, scream around this environment trying to find a mate find a mate mate produce some eggs and uh, the season and their life is uh, basically over a 
but essentially something that connects them and uh, every bird, every reptile, every great elephant, giraffe, lion, and uh, every human is um, uh, the instinct to reproduce, to leave behind uh, a living legacy in our own DNA. And uh, that is to leave behind offspring. I did see something like a ground squirrel walking away from the water there. It happened very quickly though. Quite possibly an East African ground squirrel. Alrighty, well I think uh, time now to head back over to somewhere quite familiar. Let's check out Tao again and see what's happening with the bird life around the water there. So once again back over at Tao, quite a cloudy, gloomy looking day, but uh, that's certainly not going to be stopping and the bird life from going about their business. You can hear a chin spot battus calling in the background. Red knobbed coot in the top of the frame there. A black crake walking to the right. Looks like maybe a yellow billed teal. Just got his head cut off there. It might be yellow billed or red billed. and impala coming down. There is certainly life out there. These impala had best be careful though as uh, as things do start to warm up again it is uh, half past 2, 2.30 p.m. so the hottest that it uh, will probably get to today Uh, yeah, if those impala do get too close, in spite of those crocodiles being very well fed, and speak of the devil, there's one. Looking quite well charged, actually. Very light in color. An impala could very easily fall prey to a crocodile that size. See how nervous they are around it. But it doesn't really have the ability or rather the element of surprise up on land, though they are capable of, of running at uh, quite a clip. The secret to their success lies in uh, waiting in ambush in the shallows. There's incredible footage in uh, uh, BBC's Planet Earth 3, narrated by the uh, absolutely legendary David Attenborough of uh, a mugger crocodile somewhere in India actually uh, kind of loading floating vegetation and sticks onto its back in order to uh, improve its camouflage and uh, get even closer to a, a bunch of fallow deer with success. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, 
and uh, you like wildlife programming, certainly one to want to check out and of Earth through. That crocodile starting to gape a little bit, opening his mouth. And uh, that shows that his internal temperature is rising pretty rapidly to a point where he's kind of a little bit too hot. Opening the mouth allows uh, all of that very well um, very well exposed so it's a bit of extra heat. I wonder if that lapwing a little bit further to his right is nesting. She's very snuggled down into the earth there. I don't know. Uh, Darren is asking, um, he has heard uh, it being said that birds are technically dinosaurs and how much truth there is to this. Uh, Darren, sort of yes and, and no. So a number of million years ago, uh, birds and dinosaurs shared a common ancestor. But in the evolutionary process, they kind of uh, kind of diverged. They broke away from each other. Still, there are some connections, but um, it's it's a bit like saying uh, humans are technically uh, technically chimpanzees. So there is a connection, but um, but there is also a pretty massive difference. Yeah, thanks for the question, Darren. Thought-provoking stuff. Certainly, as I say, crocodiles have been around on this planet for um, 500 million years. And a number of hundred million, uh, million years ago, we started to see dinosaurs evolving scales that uh, kind of took on the appearance of feathers and gave them insulating and certainly aerodynamic characteristics. Uh, probably initially, uh, those fairly primitive dinosaurs started hopping between trees, and gradually the need for uh, for flight developed. And then slowly but surely, uh, they evolved into the uh, tens of thousands of different bird species that we we see on Earth today. Again, a pretty winning evolutionary design. Sure, that is a magnificent crocodile. Some beautiful, beautiful scales. So there was a stage in Africa where crocodiles were hunted pretty extensively um, for that, um, that wonderful skin. To turn it into handbags and belts and all sorts of things like that. So uh, certainly there was a time where um, their populations were a little bit under threat. Thankfully though, crocodiles are now farmed very, very extensively um, in captivity. So any, any human needs for leather can be met there. A long boy has asked, do crocodiles ever catch lions? A long boy, they certainly do. Um, an, adult, an adult male lion is certainly on the menu for a big enough crocodile. Um, and Wild Earth has got footage of uh, a crocodile catching a cheetah. So uh, yeah, absolutely. They will um, not only cannibalize their own species, eating smaller crocs, but uh, they will happily take something like a lion, a cheetah, leopard, a hyena. They've got some of the strongest stomach acids known to man, giving them the ability to digest all manner of things. Porcupine quills, and animal hooves, horns, the toughest of leather and even bone. And then, uh, yeah, the dropping of a crocodile is, is similar in some ways to that of a hyena. It tends to just be a very, very, very dense, there's another croc off on the left. Come up onto land to join his mate. Yeah, the dropping's just uh, very condensed calcium. Crocodile party here today, here comes number three. Interesting that croc on the far left looks quite a bit skinnier. 
Maybe it hasn't been as lucky as uh, the one on the right to um, catch something tasty. Be nice to watch this guy actually haul himself up out of the water. Ah, I speak under correction. From a distance, he looked quite skinny, but uh, yeah, he doesn't look too bad. Nice fat content on that tail. Quite a big belly. Perhaps not quite as chunky as his friend. But uh, yeah, healthy crocodile. Sandy Franklin 69, good morning. Um, you have asked how long this croc is. It's a bit tough to say. I'd say probably about three meters for the one that we're looking, looking at up on land there. This guy's gonna haul himself out. It'd be cool to see. So yeah, three meters by no means um, an enormous, enormous crocodile. Three meters, nine, ten feet, something like that. But certainly big enough if it was to grab you by uh, the foot or the hand to uh, pull you into the water and um, finish your story right there. Uh, crocodiles in Africa are the second largest species of crocodile, the Nile croc. Whoa. Nice stretch out there. Now the largest crocodiles are of course the Australian saltwater crocodile, which can get up to over seven meters. Our Nile crocs maybe six meters at a push. Still it's all relative, they are all mammoth. Getting up to well over a ton and easily living 80 to possibly even 100 years survivors. And provided there are ample resources, they're pretty tolerant of one another as well. And the bird center screen there is a great white egret, another fish hunter using a very, very keen set of eyes with extremely good vision to spot fish swimming in even the very dirtiest of water and then uh, snap them up or spear them nicely with that bill. He's got to be a bit careful around these crocs though. The crocodiles certainly will put a bird on their menu given the chance. You can see the webbing between the toes of that uh, nice crocodile with its back to us. Very, very adept at uh, paddling through the water and of course propelling themselves along with that rudder-like tail. Now we have got absolutely no hope of uh, about swimming a crocodile, even somebody as talented as uh, maybe a Michael Phelps, an Olympic uh, gold medalist swimmer, is not going to outperform a crocodile. Joan Mello uh, has said she really likes crocs. Thanks. Thanks, Joan. I, um, I've got a soft spot for the crocs as well. And they're uh, just one of those. Um, one of those animals that are quite vilified. I think people find them a lot more difficult to connect with. But um, yeah, I've got a, a very big soft spot for reptiles in general. I always have. I've always found them extremely fascinating. Thanks, Prairie Dog. I believe you're quite, quite into the crocs as well. They've also got a, a gentle, kind of unseen side. 
uh, that we witness when a, when a female crocodile is dealing with her young. So crocodiles lay anything between about 10 and maybe 80 um, hard-shelled eggs in the soil up on one of these banks uh, during the summer. And those eggs incubate uh, for roughly 60 to 90 days. And on emergence, when those uh, little hatchlings hatch, um, they're essentially trapped in a bit of a cavity in the soil. So they, they let out a little cry, a bit, like a, a bit like a baby bird. And that female waiting nearby will hear it. So she hauls herself up out of the water, heads up to the nest. She'll dig all of the, um, all of the babies out and actually carry them down to the water in the, her powerful jaws. Again, uh, keeping in mind those jaws are strong enough to crush the skull of something like a zebra or smash a buffalo's leg. But uh, if any of those uh, tiny little neonates, tiny little crocodile hatchlings, are having some trouble getting out of their eggs, with um, the gentlest touch, she'll even be able to kind of crack them out of the eggs with her jaws. Special, special things. Yeah, and even the courtship between a male and a female crocodile as they uh, sort of begin the process of mating. I've been lucky enough to see a couple of times. Uh, remarkably gentle. And the female crocodile will uh, sort of float herself in some fairly deep water. And then the male swims up alongside her, uh, blowing just waves of bubbles around her face and the tickling her snout. Again, some very, very gentle behavior from an animal that is often seen as a pretty cold and murderous. There's two sides to every story. And just because it kills for its living doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing at all. Still very necessary to have respect for them. I wouldn't want to take a swim with, uh, with a large Nile crocodile. But uh, they're certainly not evil. They're just doing what nature intends them to do. So Leslie from the UK has asked, um, with regards to the middle crocodile, she reckons he may have lost the tip of his tail. Uh, Leslie, I think the, the croc at the top of the screen, the biggest of the three, uh, is actually the one uh, that has lost the tip of his tail. The one in the middle that's kind of curled, but it looks fairly complete. And the chap at the top is definitely missing about a foot. So well spotted if that was the one you were talking about. Um, and almost certainly I'd be willing to to gamble my um, <laughs> gamble my wages on the fact that that was bitten off by another crocodile. Uh, certainly when uh, food supplies are becoming a bit thin. Yeah, you see that chap uh, doing the moving now has got a lovely complete tail. Yeah, certainly while uh, food supplies are a bit thin and uh, in particular between two male crocodiles competing for a female's interest, uh, fights can be brutal. They'll swim up alongside each other in, uh, in the water and kind of slam their heads into each other like battering rams, uh, inflicting wounds that can be fatal, breaking jaws, sometimes losing a jaw altogether fighting off tails, fighting off arms, legs. But um, well, once again, they are survivors. And even in absolutely filthy, tepid water, they don't seem to get infections. Of course, if you or I were to sustain an injury like that, and then uh, didn't keep it clean, we could uh, very realistically be dead in a couple of days. Sure, that is a nice scene. Wonderful to have them all, all lined up like that.
Coot just coming past there, having a bit of a look. Alrighty, I think um, time now to check back in at Tembi um, on South Africa's east coast and to see what's happening up there. So back over at Tembi now, I see a couple of giraffe moving around in this uh, lovely lush green area. Call of a Natal spur fowl. Isn't that a tranquil scene? A little Eden. Again, our woolly necked stalks still around from yesterday. They are so often around these uh, these pans here at Tembi. I'm sure there are plenty of grasshoppers, frogs, that sort of thing around. Perfect uh, stalk snaps. Wonderful to get a bit of an idea of the scale of these giraffes under these uh, enormous acacia trees uh, where they're feeding. Looks like at least one very large bull on the left, possibly a cow on the right. Obviously a bit obscured by the vegetation there, but with some luck as they feed, they'll uh, move into a slightly more obliging position. Tembi is definitely one of my favorite spots here at Live at the Waterhole to have a, a little bit of a look around. Quite famously, there's a stunning, stunning a population of very large tusked male elephants. Certainly some of the biggest in Africa here. So it's always quite exciting. You never know if one of them is going to pop up. Uh, Jackie Darling has asked, um, she wonders why Madikwe has so many crocs. Are they near a river? And um, not to my knowledge at all, Jackie. And yeah, certainly the Waterberg area is not the sort of uh, sort of place where you'd expect to see crocs. I wonder if those three haven't actually been introduced. And they may very well have. Crocs are far more common in places like here, Kwazulu Natal, and um, Limpopo and Pumalanga. Slightly more tropical, much wetter landscape. So a whole collection of giraffes here, a beautiful journey of cows and what looks like one bull. A nice comment from cheetahs and other animals. This is so lovely to watch. Thank you very much, cheetahs. Happy you're enjoying it. Yeah, again, the beauty of this Live at the Waterhole program is um, our ability, in the absence of 
of uh, sort of content or things to chat about on one feed. And we have a, a nice variety, a bit of a smorgasbord, if you will. So we can just kind of hop between different locations in different corners of Africa. I wonder if this giraffe will come down and have a drink. You can see she's pretty careful around the water's edge. I don't think she's too stressed about things like crocodiles, but uh, certainly doesn't want to slip and fall in there. That giraffe has got a pretty high center of gravity. And yeah, pretty easy for one of the legs to just come skidding out from under them and leaving them prone to a bit of injury. No, maybe not thirsty. Again, we discussed this uh, funny yellow stuff on the surface of the water here yesterday. I believe it to be um, a water cabbage. So not quite a water hyacinth, but a kind of a floating weed from uh, South America. Unfortunately, very, very, very difficult to exterminate. It definitely doesn't belong here and it can be uh, pretty detrimental. It grows into like a, a solid floating mat, uh, preventing nice circulation of the water. It stops any light from coming in and it um, yeah, can cause some big problems, certainly kill all the fish. So hopefully they can do something to get rid of it. Spas Ikanov says it's always nice to see giraffes at Tembi and this always makes my day. Liam, thank you. No worries at all, Spas. My pleasure. Happy to have you on board with us. Yeah, there is something totally captivating about a giraffe. I think it comes from that um, unbelievable stride. It's like nothing else out there. Sort of both legs forward on one side at the same time. It's a little bit like a, kind of the gait of a camel, the way a camel walks. And um, even the name giraffe is believed to have, have come from Arabic. And there's a word in the Arabic language, to my understanding, as zarafa, which means uh, the one who walks swiftly. A testament to times where... Uh, Giraffes were, were much more widespread throughout the furthest northern parts of uh, North Africa, where the Arabic language is spoken. Of course, many of those giraffe populations are uh, extinct now. Sure, that is nice, hey? Just having them all out in the open. You can see the very dark skin um, of that large individual off on the right. The males are not necessarily always darker than the females. I've seen some very black cows and some also very pale bulls. But as a general rule, uh, the darker ones are male. To be absolutely sure of a giraffe's gender though, you need to look at its uh, reproductive bits. And if you can't see those, you can take a look at the ossicles or those kind of bony horn type formations on the top of the head. If they are bald, like the one we're looking at, and very, very thick, those are male. If they're very, very skinny and furry on the top, uh, that would be a female. Yeah, but the uh, black pigment in the skin, to some degree, is connected um, in the body of a male with uh, a system that produces testosterone. So the higher the testosterone, the blacker the skin. It's thought to be a, a kind of an assisting characteristic in mate selection with the females as well. They tend to prefer uh, darker bulls, those being the most dominant, the most aggressive and hopefully with the best genes. Uh, 
Ah, and Sneaky Warthog. Yeah, some pretty wonderful conditions for this warthog, which is an omnivorous animal. There is lots of food available. I'm sure plenty of fruiting trees and also a bounty of lovely lush grass and uh, grass roots going to fill his belly on. Fairly young looking pig. I'm sure he's not completely alone. Bound to be a uh, couple more around here. So that uh, friend of mine from Old Donyo did message back, we got it correct, identifying that very pale wider as the straw-tailed wider. And um, yeah, she says they're very common there around Old Donyo. And uh, apparently, if you are um, fortunate enough to find the shed tail, fe uh, tail feather, uh, the local Maasai people believe that's like an immense sign of good luck. Every day is most certainly a school day. That's how we learn. A bit tough to see what birds exactly are doing that plunging there into the water. Possibly swifts or swallows, but they're a bit far away. They just kind of swoop in and get a bit of a splash to clean their feathers off and perhaps have a little bit of a drink on the wing as well. Certainly high risk though, I saw footage recently of a tiger fish um, catching swallows coming down to gulp water like that, so certainly not without its risks. And tiger fish are found in uh, nice clean flowing waterways throughout KwaZulu Natal and um, oh, parts of the Sabi Sands and the Greater Kruger. Worth a Google if you don't know what a tiger fish is. Uh, quite a frightening looking thing. But Joe, yeah, with uh, only about 90 seconds to the end of our program for today, I'd like to thank you very much for uh, hopping on board and joining us for a, a little taste of uh, life around the water's edge at live at the water hole. But yeah, from Tadiwa, who's your director, myself, Liam Barrow, uh, your naturalist, as well as the entire unseen team of uh, tech experts, people making all the complicated stuff work, we'd like to say a very big thank you. And um, I will be back for another session of live at the water hole tomorrow as well. So be sure to tune in at the same time for uh, what promises to be another exciting installment. Never a dull day on safari. Anyway, from all of us, have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks again, and uh, hopefully see you soon. Have a wild day.
Good afternoon, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here in the Sabi Sands. Where we are in the tent. We are here on a nice, relatively cool day, considering the time of year. My name is Steve. Catching up on some reading. I'm joined over there by BK, and welcome, everybody. This is on Safari. <music> Hello everybody, good afternoon, good afternoon. Welcome to an overcast day here in Juma where the sun has not really been shining. But it is a wonderful afternoon and we're very excited for this afternoon's highlight show. If this is your first time joining us, this is indeed the 24-hour highlight reel of the last 24 hours of those things that were quite special here on Juma. Now, don't forget your questions and comments are most valuable. And actually, we encourage you to let us know what's going on for you and what comes up for you as the questions, as the, the um, clips play. So um, please do send them through using the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter, throw them in on the chat stream, or send them through using the app. BK, this is your first on Safari. Are you feeling all right? BK is a professional, everybody. He's a professional. Okay, so jumping into it, we're going to go to the first clip. Uh, very special to spend time with a dwarf mongoose. Um, sometimes we do spend lots of time, and sometimes we don't get that much time, but it seems like Cedric had a wonderful moment with him yesterday. There's grooming one another after maybe a good day of foraging around the area. This is so cute. I love watching them. Can I go? Yeah, no, they are little ninjas. You've got to love them. And how nice is that? It's typically like with lions, as they do the aloe grooming and all that. Ah, oh, looks like Nene is there, just to the west of us, but I think it's already a full, full sighting that maybe we will be lucky later on. But just like lions, all aloe grooming. So what aloe grooming means, they groom one another, keeping the relationship between each individual nice and strong. And in this Little, we call it a business of mongoose. We'll have an alpha male and an alpha female. <laughs> 